So now we know a little bit about algorithm analysis, it's time to apply it to some more interesting algorithms. And we're going to start with sorting. So sorting is the following process. You start with an input list, let's say n elements here, and you put it in the right order. So your output is the same set of elements, but in a different order. Now how do you decide what order to put it in? You need to have an ordering on the underlying set of elements. So you have something which we'll write as sort of a curly less than. And the key property that it has is that it's a total ordering. That means if you have any elements A and B, then either A is less than in this sense B, A precedes B, or B precedes A, or a is equal to B. Those are the only three things that can happen. Precisely one of them must happen. So these are exclusive ORs. I guess I write it like that. Not the usual inclusive OR. Only one of those can happen. So if you pick any two elements, one of them is bigger than the other, or well, they're equal. And we should be able to determine that. This thing here is important. The order relation. So we have plenty of examples of these already. Um, two very important ones are the set of real numbers with the usual less than relation. We can sort things according to the normal ordering. Or we can have strings with the usual lexicographic order or dictionary order. This is the order you find things in a dictionary. So for example, aardvark precedes abacus, which precedes zymergy. Um, and the definition of this ordering is something we all know. You first look at the first letter and you use the normal ordering on the alphabet. There, if you can't use that to decide, for example here, you go to the next one, etc. If you ever run out of letters, for example, like this, then the, we can think of the, the string as being padded out with empty characters and each of those comes before any other letter. So short words come before extensions of them. Any two strings on a fixed alphabet, you can tell whether one of them comes before the other in dictionary ordering or not, or if they're the same string. So sorting is, of course, an extremely important problem in itself. It was said at one time that 25% of all computer power is used for sorting. Now, that's probably not true anymore, but it still remains an extremely important problem. It's important mainly because when your data is sorted, it's so much easier to find things, which we'll see later on uh, in the searching section. But for example, suppose I have a large number of elements in some order, and you ask me, are there any duplicates? I might want to go through my database and delete duplicate records. It's much easier if you can sort the data first and then you just scan through and any duplicates will end up next to each other. Otherwise, it's a difficult problem to solve. Now we're going to be discussing general purpose sorting algorithms and they operate on lists. Whether the list is implemented, say, as an array or a linked list, isn't going to make any difference to the correctness of the algorithm, but it will make a difference to the running time. The performance does depend on the implementation. The correctness doesn't. This is a key thing we want to understand about our algorithm analysis. So now I want to discuss three main features that a sorting algorithm may or may not have. The first one is what is called being comparison-based. So. We know that sorting is based on comparisons. If we have two elements, we can ask whether one of them is bigger than the other. 
and we can ask whether they're equal. For a comparison-based sorting algorithm, those are the only questions that can be asked. So we have some kind of black box here which just tells us the answer. We can't peek into the internal representation of the data. So there are some sorting algorithms, for example, that are specialized for certain types of data. We can sort a large number of strings quickly by first sorting on the first character, then the next one, etc. But that requires us to know that they're strings. For a comparison-based sorting algorithm, it's a general purpose algorithm that can work for any data type as long as it has this basic comparison operation. So we're going to be focusing only on those from now on. The next property is what's called being in place. An in place sorting algorithm is one that may use a little bit of extra working space, but it's a bounded fixed amount of space independent of the input size. So for example, it needs some room to do swaps you need an extra bit of space to do a swap, right, as we've seen. But the key thing is you don't need an amount of space for your working, for example, which is proportional to the size of the input. Now, some of the algorithms we're going to see do satisfy this, and some don't. But it's an important property, especially if you're in an environment where there isn't much space or you have enormous input. The last property I want to talk about is stability. So what does it mean for a sorting algorithm to be stable? So imagine that you have your elements which are to be sorted. And remember that you're just sorting by keys. So you can have a large data object. And these A's here are meant to be representing just keys, some part of the object, the bit that you're using to sort on. And they happen to be the same. You can have two objects which are different but have the same key there. Some sorting algorithms now every sorting algorithm will convert this input list to some other list where these A's will end up together. It could be that this A goes here and this one goes there so if it's always the case that duplicate keys don't change their relative order, that's called stable. However, there are some sorting algorithms where, in fact, those two A's would be swapped. You wouldn't be able to tell just by looking at the key values that they'd been swapped, but the objects that they represent will have been, and that could be important. So a classic example of why stability is useful is the following. Suppose you have a database, say, and you're sorting all the people in it by surname. So you do that with your sorting algorithm. And imagine that you now got this. Now we're going to sort by given name, first name. Now we might be looking at the first name, and these two objects would have the same first name. And their surnames have been put like that. We're trying to refine the original sort that we have, but if you have a, an unstable algorithm, it may swap these two. They'll be in the right order, close to each other in terms of first name, but the surname order has been destroyed. That's something you really don't want. You always would want a stable sorting algorithm in such a situation. Now, it turns out that it's very hard to satisfy all of these properties especially if you want to be reasonably fast. So that's one of the key points that I want to mention here. There is no perfect sorting algorithm. And in fact, algorithm analysis is all about trade-offs. Sometimes it's a trade-off between running time and space use, but sometimes there are other interesting features that you want to have of an algorithm, and they turn out to be essentially incompatible. So you have to understand what's the situation that you're in, what particular features are important and which are maybe less important and can be sacrificed for that particular application. So in order to do some algorithm analysis for sorting algorithms, we need to have some elementary operations. And what are they going to be? Well, it turns out there's two main ones. One 
consists of comparisons, which we've already seen. Basically, a question that looks like that, or maybe that. This will be a constant time operation for a given data type. For different types of data, they may take different times, but for any specific application with a specific amount of data, there will be a fixed amount of time to do one of these operations, which is independent of how many things are in your actual list. So that's a good idea for an elementary operation. The next one involves moving things around, because that's what you do when you're sorting. So it's going to be things like swaps or exchanges, or data moves might be another way of doing it. Each of these should be a constant time operation for a given data type that you are dealing with in an application. So swapping two elements, for example, if we have an array, it's pretty straightforward. I need some temporary variable here to store one of them in. I'll put this value over here. I'll overwrite with B over there, and then I'll move this value back over here. It's only a constant amount of space required and a constant amount of time to do that. Let's say, so that's an elementary operation there. If I have instead some kind of linked list set up. Again, swapping A and B only requires a finite amount of work and fixed. I have to make sure that this pointer ends up pointing to B and this pointer points to A and I have to be careful what order I do that in so I don't break the chain and lose where I am. But you only have to move around a small number of pointers in order to swap A and B. So swapping's an elementary operation in both cases there. So that was swaps. Sometimes instead of swapping, we just want to move data or insert things somewhere else. Uh, that's easy in the case of a list. If I want to move this, say, to there, Suppose I have some C here. I want to stick it bef between C and B. So I need a pointer here. And then I just have to reorganize the pointers so that whatever's going here instead goes to C. And then C goes to A. And then I delete the pointers that I don't need. I've got a few other things here that need tidying up. But again, it's still a fixed constant amount of work. On the other hand, if I have an array, then inserting an element or moving an element can be very difficult. Suppose I already have something in here and I want to put this element, say B, that's here between C and A. I have to actually move A and potentially everything to the right of it along in order to make room, most likely. And it could be that you have to move almost the whole array. So order n amount of work, that's not an elementary operation. So typically when we're analyzing sorting algorithms, when it comes to this moving data around, we'll only use swaps for the arrays, but you could use either, in fact, for linked lists, depending on which was easier. So we're finally ready to analyze our first sorting algorithm, and we're going to start with a very easy one, selection sort. So imagine that you have a list here. What selection sort does, it scans along until it finds the maximum element. If there's more than one, it finds the first. I suppose it's this one. Then we make sure that that element goes to the end. If we're in an array, we would always swap it with this element. In a linked list, we might just move it, or we could swap if we really wanted to. Either way, this element now ends up at the end, and we chop off the list. Now we have a list which is slightly smaller than before, one element less. We ignore this one completely, 
we do the whole thing again on the sublist and continue until everything is done. In other words, this is the largest element in the list. Then we choose the largest element remaining, the second largest element, etc., all the way to the end. It's completely obvious that that's correct. It's going to have them all listed in sorted order by the end. This is comparison based. We just used ordinary comparisons. It's a general purpose algorithm. I didn't say anything about the data types we're using. Is it in place? Well, yes it is. Okay, the amount of space required for extra working is no more than what you need for doing a swap or reallocating pointers. So that has some nice properties. The main problem with it, of course, is that it is very slow. So here's the pseudocode for selection sort. Takes a list of size n. You see in line 2, the counter goes from the end of the list, working its way back down to the beginning. At each iteration i, we find the maximum of the first i plus 1 elements. So at the beginning, we're finding the maximum of the entire list. And then we step back down to the bottom, at which point we're only finding the maximum of a list of size 1. In line 3, we find the maximum element using the algorithm that we looked at in the previous lecture. And then, if necessary, we get this maximum element and we swap it to its correct position, which is position I. Now let's have a look at selection sort on this input. We're going to repeatedly use the maximum finding procedure, so I'll use the left finger to indicate the maximum found so far, and the right to indicate where we are in our scanning. We start here. Obviously this is the maximum. We use the swap version, or we'll swap it in. That's done. Now we do the same thing again. And again we swap that in. Now this time there are two fives, but the way we had the maximum finding procedure it finds the first one, so this will end up being the maximum, not that one. And we will swap that in to that position, then we'll end up swapping that in, then we will end up swapping that in, then we'll end up swapping this, this, and this, and we're done. Of course these last few swaps were just swapping an element with itself, because it was already in the right position. Now selection sort has quite a few negative aspects, but one of the positive ones is that it does a very small number of data moves or swaps. It does kind of the minimum that you need. If you think about it, if you start with a, a list, say where everything is like that, out of order, then at some point this element has to come over here, this one has to come here, etc. Once you move the current maximum that you're looking at towards the end, it goes to its correct position and it stays there. It only moves once in that way. If moves are very, very, very expensive, that might be quite helpful. For example, suppose you have some very, very large statues, and you have to move them, sort them by height. You can measure the height quite easily. It's not at all difficult. You can put a lot of effort in, in fact, climbing up there using trigonometry if you need to work out which one is higher. You have an incentive to do that because you really don't want to move them unless you have to. But finally, when it comes right down to you have to move them, and that's where something like selection sort might have some relevance. Of course, in a computing situation, it's not a very useful algorithm. In fact, it's essentially never used. But from the point of view of analysis, it's a nice introductory example. And also, the idea behind it of extracting the maximum repeatedly turns out to be really useful later on when we talk about heap sort.
Now one thing about selection sort, which you can see immediately without doing any complicated analysis, is that it's not very efficient. All you have to do is think about what happens on the first and second iterations through. The first one, you scan through repeatedly, updating the maximum so far, until you find it. Then the maximum is somewhere, then you move the maximum to the end. You haven't changed the order of most of them. You've moved one element, say, there, let's say. You may have swapped another one back there. But most of them are unchanged in order. Then, you do the next iteration, and you go through again. In order to compute the maximum, you start with this, and you say, is this bigger than this one? If it is, leave it, leave the maximum to be that one, otherwise update it to be this one. But you already did that the first time round, on the first iteration. Uh, you should save that information somehow. It seems silly to do that calculation again. It's too many comparisons being made. So it's fairly obvious from that that selection sort is very inefficient. It's repeatedly doing a lot of unnecessary work. So as usual, we come to the questions at the end of the lecture. And we start out with the obvious one. What actually is the running time of selection sort? I said it wasn't very efficient, but how long does it take? How many elementary operations is it taking? That's the first thing to think about. And related to that, you might want to think about what is the best case for the input? What is the worst input that you can give it in terms of making it do the most amount of work? Next question relates to the basic properties. We know that selection sort is in place, but is it stable? You might want to think about the basic version of selection sort that we looked at and also maybe whether it could be modified. If you find out that it isn't stable, are there any modifications that could be made? Selection sort, like all the sorting algorithms, will deal with works for an arbitrary list, but there are some differences in performance when you deal with linked lists as opposed to arrays. That's another thing you should look at. Finally, this is a more speculative question. Is there a way to find the maximum of your input data more efficiently than just scanning through. So think hard about those and we'll be back with insertion sort in the next lecture.